the west eastern divan in twelve books by johann wolfgang von goethe seventeen forty nine to eighteen thirty two from book four book of reflections section twelve this is a librivox recording read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org question not through what gate of grace into god's city thou hast come but where at first thou tookest thy place there bide and fill thy quiet room then gaze around behold the wise the mighty set in high command those the enlighteners of thine eyes these to add virtue to thy hand if loyal servant of the state thy tranquil uses thou dost prove know thou shalt suffer no man's hate and many men will yield thee love the life of action faithfulness the prince shall fail not to behold the new thing shall be seen no less firm in endurance than the old if strong and gentle thou thy round of life shall run and touch the goal thou in thy measure shalt be found exemplar to some younger soul footnote this poem was sent from wiesbaden thirtieth may eighteen fifteen with two other stanzas for the jubilee of work of the weimar officials kerms and shard End footnote. End of the west eastern divan in twelve books by johann wolfgang von goethe seventeen forty nine to eighteen thirty two from book four the book of reflections Section 12. Song of Myself, Section 12, by Walt Whitman. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the 12th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Song of Myself, Section 12, by Walt Whitman, read by Chris Pyle. The butcher boy puts off his killing clothes, or sharpens his knife at the stall in the market. I loiter, enjoying his repartee and his shuffle and breakdown. Blacksmiths with grimed and hairy chests environ the anvil. Each has his main sledge. They are all out. There is a great heat in the fire. From the cinder-strewed threshold I follow their movements. The lithe shear of their waists plays even with their massive arms. Overhand the hammers swing, overhand so slow, overhand so sure. They do not hasten, each man hits in his place. End of Song of Myself Section 12 by Walt Whitman Read by Chris Pyle Twelfth Night From Beautiful Stories from Shakespeare by E. Nesbitt This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Orsino, the Duke of Illyria, was deeply in love with a beautiful countess named Olivia. Yet was all his love in vain, for she disdained his suit, and when her brother died, she sent back a messenger from the duke, bidding him tell his master that for seven years she would not let the very heir behold her face, but that, like a nun, she would walk veiled, and all this for the sake of a dead brother's love, which she would keep fresh and lasting in her sad remembrance. The duke longed for someone to whom he could tell his sorrow, and repeat over and over again the story of his love, and chance brought him such a companion, for about this time a goodly ship was wrecked on the Illyrian coast, and among those who reached land in safety were the captain and a fair young maid named Viola. But she was little grateful for being rescued from the perils of the sea, since she feared that her twin brother was drowned, Sebastian, as dear to her as the heart in her bosom, 
and so like her that but for the difference in their manner of dress one could hardly be told from the other the captain for her comfort told her that he had seen her brother bind himself to a strong mast that lived upon the sea and that there was hope that he might be saved viola now asked in whose country she was and learning that the duke orsino ruled there and was as noble in his nature as in his name she decided to disguise herself in male attire and seek for employment with him as a page in this she succeeded and now from day to day she had to listen to the story of orsino's love at first she sympathized very truly with him but soon her sympathy grew to love at last it occurred to orsino that his hopeless love-suit might prosper better if he sent this pretty lad to woo olivia for him viola unwillingly went on this errand but when she came to the house malvolio olivia's steward a vain officious man sick as his mistress told him of self-love forbade the messenger admittance viola however who was now called cesario refused to take any denial and vowed to have speech with the countess olivia hearing how her instructions were defied and curious to see this daring youth said we'll once more hear orsino's embassy when viola was admitted to her presence and the servants had been sent away she listened patiently to the reproaches which this bold messenger from the duke poured upon her and listening she fell in love with the supposed cesario and when cesario had gone olivia longed to send some love token after him so calling malvolio she bade him follow the boy he left his ring behind him she said taking one from her finger tell him i will none of it malvolio did as he was bid and then viola who of course knew perfectly well that she had left no ring behind her saw with a woman's quickness that olivia loved her then she went back to the duke very sad at heart for her lover and for olivia and for herself it was but cold comfort she could give orsino who now sought to ease the pangs of despised love by listening to sweet music while cesario stood by his side ah said the duke to his page that night you too have been in love a little answered viola what kind of woman is it he asked of your complexion she answered what years if faith was his next question to this came the pretty answer about your years my lord too old by heaven cried the duke let still the woman take an elder than herself and viola very meekly said i think it will well my lord by and by orsino begged cesario once more to visit olivia and to plead his love suit but she thinking to dissuade him said if some lady loved you as you love olivia ah that cannot be said the duke but i know viola went on what love woman may have for a man my father had a daughter loved a man as it might be she added blushing perhaps were i a woman i should love your lordship and what is her history he asked a blank my lord viola answered she never told her love but let concealment like a worm in the bud feed on her damask cheek she pined and thought and with a green and yellow melancholy she sat like patience on a monument smiling at grief was not this love indeed she died thy sister of her love my boy the duke asked and viola who had all the time been telling her own love for him in this pretty fashion said i am all the daughters my father has and all the brothers sir shall i go to the lady to her in haste said the duke at once forgetting all about the story and give her this jewel so viola went and this time poor olivia was unable to hide her love and openly confessed it with such passionate truth that viola left her hastily saying never more will i deplore my master's tears to you but in vowing this viola did not know the tender pity she would feel for others suffering so when olivia in the violence of her love sent a messenger praying cesario to visit her once more cesario had no heart to refuse the request but the favours which olivia bestowed upon this mere page aroused the jealousy of sir andrew ogcheek a foolish rejected lover of hers who at that time was staying at her house with her merry old uncle sir toby 
this same sir toby dearly loved a practical joke and knowing sir andrew to be an arrant coward he thought that if he could bring off a duel between him and cesario there would be rare sport indeed so he induced sir andrew to send a challenge which he himself took to cesario the poor page in great terror said i will return again to the house i am no fighter back you shall not to the house said sir toby unless you fight me first and as he looked a very fierce old gentleman viola thought it best to await sir andrew's coming and when he at last made his appearance in a great fright if the truth had been known she tremblingly drew her sword and sir andrew in like fear followed her example happily for them both at this moment some officers of the court came in on the scene and stopped the intended duel viola gladly made off with what speed she might while sir toby called after her a very poultry boy and more a coward than a hare now while these things were happening sebastian had escaped all the dangers of the deep and had landed safely in illyria where he determined to make his way to the duke's court on his way thither he passed olivia's house just as viola had left it in such a hurry and whom should he meet but sir andrew and sir toby sir andrew mistakingly sebastian for the cowardly cesario took his courage in both hands and walking up to him struck him saying there's for you why there's for you and there and there said sebastian bidding back a great deal harder and again and again till sir toby came to the rescue of his friend sebastian however tore himself free from sir toby's clutches and drawing his sword would have fought them both but that olivia herself having heard of the quarrel came running in and with what reproaches sent sir toby and his friend away then turning to sebastian whom she thought to be cesario she besought him with many a pretty speech to come into the house with her sebastian half dazed and all delighted with her beauty and grace readily consented and that very day so great was olivia's baste they were married before she had discovered that he was not cesario or sebastian was quite certain whether or not he was in a dream while orsino hearing how ill cesario sped with olivia visited her himself taking cesario with him olivia met them both before her door and seeing as she thought her husband there reproached him for leaving her while to the duke she said that his suit was as fat and wholesome to her as howling after music still so cruel said orsino still so constant she answered then orsino's anger growing to cruelty he vowed that to be revenged on her he would kill cesario whom he knew she loved come boy he said to the page and viola following him as she moved away said i to do you rest a thousand deaths would die a great fear took hold on olivia and she cried aloud cesario husband stay her husband asked the duke angrily no my lord not i said viola call forth the holy father cried olivia and the priest whom had married sebastian and olivia coming in declared cesario to be the bridegroom o thou dissembling cub the duke exclaimed farewell and take her but go where thou and i henceforth may never meet at this moment sir andrew came up with bleeding crown complaining that cesario had broken his head and sir toby's as well i never hurt you said viola very positively you drew your sword on me but i bespoke you fair and hurt you not yet for all her protesting no one there believed her but all their thoughts were on a sudden changed to wonder when sebastian came in i am sorry madam he said to his wife i have hurt your kinsman pardon me sweet even for the vows we made each other so late ago one face one voice one habit and two persons cried the duke looking first at viola and then at sebastian an apple cleft in two said one who knew sebastian is not more twin than these two creatures which is sebastian i never had a brother said sebastian i had a sister whom the blind waves and surges had devoured were you a woman he said to viola i should let my tears fall upon your cheek and say thrice welcomed drowned viola then viola rejoicing to see her dead brother alive confessed that she was indeed his sister viola as she spoke orsino felt the pity that is akin to love boy he said thou hast said to me a thousand times thou never shouldst love woman like to me and all those sayings will i overswear viola replied and all those swearings keep true 
give me thy hand orsino cried in gladness thou shalt be my wife and my fancy's queen thus was the gentle viola made happy while olivia found in sebastian a constant lover and a good husband and he in her a true and loving wife end of twelfth night by william shakespeare retold by e nesbitt and read by amy graymore in holton maine the librivox twelfth anniversary song sung to the tune of the yuppity song traditional folk song celebratory librivox lyrics by maria casper this is a librivox recording sung in honor of the twelfth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Do you remember how at first to LibriVox you found your way? What was the book that brought you here and made you want to stay? The first you heard, the first you read, not the first that got stuck in your head. Happy birthday, LibriVox, a dozen years of books galore, wishing you a LibriVox, a dozen, a dozen more. Yeehaw! Some have been here since the dawn, the founding crew, the lucky few. Most of us came later on, but we are lucky too. Oh yeah. We found somewhere to freely share the books we love with folks who care. Happy birthday, LibriVox. A dozen years of books galore. Wishing you, dear LibriVox, a dozen, dozen more. Together we have learned about audacity and microphones. When copyright gives us a doubt, we know we're not alone. For here are the from many lands, encouragement and helping hands. Happy birthday, LibriVox! A dozen years of books galore. Wishing you, dear LibriVox, a dozen, dozen more. While I drive to work each day, a book helps make my journey fly. When to sleep I drift away, a book's my lullaby. Right. You read to me, I read to you. Glad, I'm glad I joined this merry crew. Get out there, little Madog and Libre Fox, if you see Lord Manasa there. Wishing you, dear Libre Fox, a dozen, dozen more. Happy birthday, Libre Fox, a dozen years of books galore. Wishing you, dear Libre Fox, a dozen, a dozen more. Woohoo! What happened to Yay! Yeah. End of the LibriVox 12th Anniversary Song, sung by ten enthusiastic LibriVoxateers.